this in the glorious name of your son Jesus that we do pray. Amen. Amen. A very timid gentleman had heard his pastor preach over and over again about boldness and sharing Jesus uh, with the lost. This man began to pray for the Lord to give him a sign as to when it would be that he would witness. The next day, he got on the bus to, ri to ride to work. Just as he sat down, the biggest, meanest looking man he'd ever seen on the, got on the bus, walked down the aisle, and sat next to him. When the man sat down, he began to weep. He turned to the timid man and said, I'm lost, and, you don't know how, and I don't know how to be saved. I need someone to tell me about Jesus. Are you a Christian? The timid man immediately bowed his head and prayed to the Lord. Lord, is this a sign? <laughs> you know, when it comes to us sharing our faith, I'm not sure who is more uptight about it, us or those who would share our, our faith with. I think sometimes we convince ourselves that evangelism is best left to the professionals. So those people with the gift of evangelism or the Billy Grahams of the world are certainly pastor. That's what you're supposed to do, right? Or maybe we hear the stories of all the sharing their faith and think, I could never do that. Or that's not what happens when I share the gospel. When I share the gospel, I always get strange looks or deriding comments or whatever it might be. Well, if we are to take Jesus' word seriously in Matthew 28... There's a place for all of us to sense a call and a conviction about sharing our faith. And so this morning, as we conclude our study of the Gospel of Matthew, I'll also talk about how to share your faith with the hope that we will all be more intentional about it, as well as being more relaxed. So if you're not already in Matthew 28, uh, please turn there. Remember that in Jesus commissioning his disciples, again, these are the 12 guys, well, now at this point, 11, because Jesus is no longer here. The 11 guys that have been following Jesus for three years. They've been part of his ministry. They've known him as his person. He's done miraculous things to reveal who he is. That when he claims to be the Son of God, he's shown them in practical ways that he is the Son of God. And to top it all off, he dies and is raised from the dead. And now this risen, resurrected Jesus stands before them. And effectively, at least in the Gospel of Matthew, the last words he has to share, the last thing he's saying is again, carry on my message. Bring it forward. Go to places I can't go and let people know about me. So as we've looked about this commissioning or this sending, and we saw you know, last week that really any person in any situation, whether you're, you're talking about a family, you're talking about a business, when you're passing it along to the next generation, there are these kind of moments where, again, you want your vision and your direction and your promise to be given to those that you're sending out. So ultimately, in this commission, it involves one main verb and three participles. And I know people's eyes start rolling in their heads when they start talking about things like that, main verbs and participles. But also it would be like me saying to you, run down the street, carrying this bag, stopping at this and such houses, and then laughing all the way. You know, basically we would understand the main point and the main verb is you're running down the street. But how you're doing, the manner you do it, what the purpose is, is in those particles, participles of uh, laughing and, and stopping and carrying, again, that defines how the running is going to happen. So ultimately, as we read in Matthew 28, starting in verse 19, where it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Again, the main point, the main thing that Jesus is telling these apostles, again, the people that more than anyone else has internalized his message, go and multiply, go and make disciples. You are disciples. You've been with me. You've heard me. You've been impacted by my message. So now go, now go and you tell two friends. And they'll tell two, tell two friends. And they'll two... And so, remember that Fabergé organic? It's kind of like that in terms of the multiplication that Jesus is pointing to here. And again, it's about making disciples, making learners, making students, making followers. It's not just about coming and believing in Jesus. It's not just about saying a prayer, even though I believe that it is only faith 
It is only believing in Jesus and the sacrifice that He accomplished on Calvary's cross that brings us salvation. And when we believe that that's true, we recognize that when Jesus said He was the Son of God, when He said when He died on the cross, He was dying for our sins, and in coming to faith in Him, we believe that that's true. We affirm it as being true. Then we entrust ourselves to that. That's what salvation is. That is the message of the gospel. That we believe the, the ministry and the work of Jesus as being true. And then we entrust ourselves to that. The thing we're banking on in, in terms of our salvation, in terms of our relationship with God, our entrance into heaven is about, again, us, us entrusting ourselves and putting ourselves on the work of Jesus Christ. And again, that is the gospel. But again, what Jesus is calling his disciples to do is not just make people who believe that, but who follow that. That after salvation, that there is a, there's a transformation of life. There's a greater conviction in terms of their living. Now ultimately, we look at more of the words that are in this passage and the, and the things that we would learn from it. This whole construction of baptizing them in the name of the Father and then the Son and of the Holy Spirit is fairly rare in Scripture. Believe it or not, it's not that often that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all mentioned together. But clearly, the fact that Jesus is saying this in this context certainly says something significant about His understanding of the Godhead. Of, of, of who God is, and maybe a basic way that we would describe Him. If there's anyone that can talk to us about who God is, it's Jesus, right? I mean, also when He says, Father, Son, and the Spirit, He's saying, by the way, I'm the Son. I'm that second guy. You know, so, that, so therefore, when we hear Jesus talking about the relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit, we know that there's an equality there. There's a connectedness there in terms of the relationship that God has within Himself, being one and yet being expressed or internalized, well, but, well being three in person. You know, a good analogy is just as a side. Because I know that you know it's tough to mention the Trinity without giving some analogy for that, but it really is similar to water. I mean, ultimately, water is H2O, right? But water is expressed in three ways: it's expressed as steam, it's, it's, it's expressed as a solid, and it's expressed in liquid. So, in its essence, steam, water, and ice are 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 all the same. They're they're identical in terms of their chemical composition. But in terms of our internalizing that, like over the past week, you don't want to be in a sauna. You don't want to be experiencing steam. You want either water or ice. But then when it's 20 degrees out, what do we want? We want to experience steam. And so that, 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 that's one of the analogies to help us internalize just what Jesus is pointing to here. But when, when, when again, Jesus is in this context talking about, okay, you're going, you're multiplying my ministry. Again, you're making disciples. The first thing, or, or again, the content of what I want that disciple making to look like is I want you to be baptizing people into us, into, the, into God, into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, again, affirming their equality, but even more so affirming the nature of the relationship that God wants to have with his people. So when we look at this word baptism, it's actually not a translation of a Greek word. I mean, basically, a lot of time in the Bible, when we're reading English words, we're reading English words that are translations of Greek words. Like, for instance, we've, we, many of us have heard the word agape. Well, agape is one of the ways the Greek said love. But we don't say agape in the New Testament, in the English New Testament, we translate that love. Well, guess what? When English translators confronted the word baptizo, there was no English word that corresponded with it. So there was no way to translate that word. So what they did is they transliterated it. And those they came up with an English word that was kind of an English way of expressing the Greek word. But baptism and baptizo is a very interesting thing in terms of the nature of the relationship that God desires to have with his people. See, it's about identification. It's about oneness. 
It's about connectedness between two items. It was actually used in the context of dyeing a shirt. That a shirt would be baptized in water. So ultimately, that shirt would be identified with the dye. Again, it would come out and would be marked by the dye that it was put in. And what a beautiful picture, again, of the kind of relationship that God wants to have with his people. It's not a distant relationship. It's not a God from afar. It's not you believe in me and I want no identification or connection with you. No, on the other hand, it's a God that says, I want to be intimately connected with you. I want to be, in a sense, part of the fiber of your being. So again, as, you're, as I'm describing in these particles, the way you make disciples, make sure that you're baptizing them. Make sure that you're giving them a physical representation of what God has done spiritually within them. So when we think about the relationship that God makes possible through Christ, that we are indelibly connected with God, God is indelibly connected with us. The Bible actually describes in the process of our salvation that Jesus, again, Jesus dies on the cross. He purchases the forgiveness that our sin needs, bears on his body our sin, so that now we're forgiven. That actually gives God permission to sanctify us. So what happens is the Holy Spirit actually comes inside our lives sanctifies us, and makes us a temple for Jesus to live in. So in other words, when you think about the nature of the relationship, the Bible describes, and again, what this word baptism communicates, that's the nature of the relationship God wants for us to have. That's what He wants us to understand. How close does God want to be with you? He wants to be inside you. How close does he want you to be with him? He wants you at, your right, at his right hand. That we're in Christ, we're identified with him. And again, this is the, this is the neat word that again, that they're told. Go and make, is going and make disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. You know, it's interesting to me that this word baptism is combined with this, with this word teaching. Because it's, 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 really, it's an interesting connection that's made. You know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like becoming part of the mafia. Okay, it's not, it's not like the mafia, but then the whole process of, you know, you become part of the mafia, right? You know, you come along and I, I give you the kiss, or I give you the handshake, and you, yeah, you're part of the family right now. But as part of the family, you know, you've got to know how to treat Uncle Vito. You know, you just don't do Uncle Vito. You know, don't, don't turn your back on Uncle Vito. You can't look, but you know, you respect the mama. You, 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 you feel like this is how the family operates in terms of what you do. And bada bing, you're part of the family. That, but it, but see, the, you, see, what you do doesn't affect being in the family, right? Like you and the family, you're in the family. It doesn't, see, if it doesn't stop, you might have a horse head in your bed, but still, you're part of the family. The family deals with family. But see, in other words, you're part, see, there's the identification that comes, but then there's a protocol, right? Like there's a certain aspect of here. If you're in the family, this is how the family works. Well, that's how Jesus is describing it here. That we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized in the Father, we're baptized in the Spirit. But you know something? There's also teaching them to obey. See, there's a protocol, there's an action, there's a behavior, there's an expectation of what these disciples will do in terms of being obedient to Jesus. And, and please don't miss that obedience to what Jesus says is part of what makes a disciple the disciple. Uh, baptize, baptizing does it, but it's, it's a both and and not an either or. It's not I'm baptized or I obey. It's I baptize and I obey in terms of this direct, in terms of this connection. And so therefore we, we, we have, I'm just trying to catch it. In my notes. I got the bada bing in, so that, that's important. I, I, I'm for Okay, so I just, you know, got to make. So, but, so, so therefore Jesus presents this picture in terms of, again, that, that, that's the point I, that's in my notes that I want. Realize when Jesus says, again, baptizing them into the Father, teaching them everything that I have commanded you, teaching you to obey that, 
Jesus in some ways is making a significant statement of what he believes about what he has taught. You know, when Jesus talks to 11 Jewish guys that are very committed to Scripture, very committed to what God has communicated to the Jewish people throughout their history, and for Jesus to say, when you're making these disciples, you're teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Now, in no way does that, does, does that say Jesus dismisses the teaching of the Old Testament or sets it aside, but he equates his teaching with it. You know, there's actually a, a, a tendency within Christendom, that, that, that there's a, a thinking and a philosophy, that you know something, the only one we need to listen to is Jesus. You know, all we have to concentrate on is, is, is the gospel and what kind of person was Jesus. And it doesn't matter really what the Old Testament says. It really doesn't matter what Paul says. And really, that is completely inconsistent with what Jesus would be saying here. Because if you look at what Jesus says, when you think about what Jesus affirms in terms of what he has taught, it is all about referencing the Old Testament. It's all about going to places Right, Emily? Is that what you're having your phone there? You're looking at the Old Testament? Good. And so therefore, it, it, it's, it's again, it's, it's Jesus reinforcing what, uh, what the Old Testament said in terms of what he's saying. And because Paul is a minister and, a, and an apostle of Christ and has continued on in his ministry in terms of just completing the work or, or really just reinforcing the, the work that Jesus did in terms of his life, Jesus would in no way in saying that you're supposed to teach them and command them to obey everything that I have taught. He's not dismissing other passages of Scripture in terms of what the Old Testament says and what Paul says. But in all of this, really to cap it off, we, again, when we think about making disciples is really the, the main goal of uh, Jesus' commission, what he's calling the disciples to... The going gives the direction of that activity. All nations describes the extent of that. How far is that supposed to go? It's going to all nations. What's the content of that? It's baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything. And then what, look at what Jesus ends with. A, pro, a promise that he will be there with them always. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know, when you think about where these disciples will go, when you think about how the church will respond, and I know I've kind of intimated to this before in terms of these messages, but when you think about where the church will go in terms of its ministry, how far the gospel will reach, the things that people will go through in terms of that, what a comfort to know that Jesus says, I'm going to be with you. Then again, I'm not setting you out on your own. You're not supposed to invent this on your own. You're not supposed to accomplish this on your own. That, that again, when there's a need for relationship, there's a need for power, there's need for guidance, Jesus, is, Jesus promise, promises that he is going to be with us. And you know, in some ways, naturally, Jesus would speak of this in terms of disciples receiving this. In other words, when you t take hold of Jesus' commissioning and you go and make disciples... That, that the, 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 those disciples will have Jesus with them. But in this context, Jesus is more talking about those who are discipling. That it's, it's those people more so that internalize Jesus' commissioning, make it their intent to, to witness for Christ, and make disciples of people that Jesus promises to be with us when we're doing that. Now that's not to say Jesus is not present again. He's inside us all the time. But it's interesting to me that when you think about the times when Jesus spoke, speaks specifically about being with us. I mean there are, there are a few examples of this beyond this. But one is in the context of, of us making disciples of all nations. And the other one is actually when we're dealing with conflict. When, when, when we're dealing with interpersonal relationship, and Jesus says, where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. The context of that verse is when people are dealing with conflict and dealing with church discipline in Matthew 18. So it's just interesting to me that, again, when we internalize this call, we internalize this commission, 
When we become serious about our faith, to the extent that we would pass it along to someone else, Jesus promises us to be with us. And like I said last week, that I don't know that there's a better way for us to affirm our faith outside of sharing with someone else. You know, in, 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 like if you really, if you really think about it, if you, if you truly believe what your what, what Jesus said, if you truly understand the implications of the gospel and what Jesus is communicating through that, then certainly uh, you would see the value and the compulsion, the conviction that comes to share that faith. But how how your faith becomes confirmed when you do that? That also you become more convinced of the value of Jesus when you tell someone about Jesus. You become more convinced of the value of the cross when you tell someone about the cross. And there's an important dynamic, there's an important part of the, of the life of God, of the ministry of the Spirit, that will only come when we're releasing that to people. When we're, when we're taking the risk and we're taking the chance to ultimately be disciple makers in terms of Jesus' call here. And so ultimately, when we think about what Jesus is, is, is directing his disciples to, it seems only fitting that we talk a little bit about how it is that we do this. How do we share our faith? You know, when we think about the different aspects of what God would call us to, you know, in terms of glorifying him, honoring him with our lives, edifying believers, and then sharing our faith with those that don't know him. The thing that always seems to get lost, the, the, the thing that we have a hard time, the hardest time to emphasize is again our reaching out to those that don't know Jesus in a personal way. And so I want to, I want to talk about that. I want us to think about what are the things that hold us back? What is, what is the things that we struggle with in terms of again our witness for Jesus? And I think the place we really need to start in the whole idea of sharing our faith is with us. That it starts with, again, where are we with Jesus? To what extent are we growing in Him? To what extent are we filled with the Spirit and do we care about that? Again, to what extent are we disciples? To what extent are we obeying the, the, the commands of Christ? Because again, if we are not passionate about Jesus, if we're not growing in Him, if we're not in vital relationship with Him, it's going to be, seem very odd to us to pass that along uh, to someone else. Because it, 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 will, it will seem artificial to them, and it will feel odd to you. So again, this is not evangelism. When we share our faith, this, it doesn't flow from a vacuum. It doesn't flow from, again, an empty relationship with God, and then I pass what, 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 it's what's empty to someone, to someone else in terms of the truth. It has to flow from a vital relationship with God and a faithful relationship with God. Put another way, if our talk about Jesus is bigger and better than our walk with Jesus, that is a major problem. If our talk about Jesus is bigger and better than our walk with Jesus, that is a major problem. Now understand, I'm not talking about being perfect. I'm not talking about in terms of our witness, our character, integrity. We never make a mistake. We never sin. In fact, I think part of the uh, testimony of Jesus is the vulnerability, the accountability we have about our behavior. The fact that we should be the kind of people that when we do something wrong, we go back to people and say, by the way, I did that wrong. I ask for your forgiveness. And the whole dynamic of us presenting ourselves to people as not perfect people. See, Jesus doesn't save perfect people. Jesus doesn't save people that, that are not broken and, 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 are, and, are, and are sinless. No, he, he saves people that are broken, that understands their need for salvation. That all of us are, are um, well, I can't think of anything but broken in terms of ju just our inability to function in life, our inability to, uh, to develop the power and the capacity to, 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 to negotiate through relationships, to, to be a good employer, to be a good employee, to be a good father, to be a good mother, to be a good child. We don't have that capacity. We're all broken in that. We all make mistakes. And so again, as believers, and we're living our lives before people, the fact that we have a basis in God 
for us to be forgiven. To not present a picture to the world that you know something, Christians are perfect people. Christians never do things wrong. So people look at that and say, well, I'm not a perfect piece, per person. I, I, don't, I, I do things wrong, so how can I connect with that message? So in some ways, when we talk about our failings and our faulting, in terms of our witness, again, I'm not talking about perfection, but I am talking about us growing in God to the, to the extent that we bring to the dynamic of our witness for Christ a power and a conviction that is contagious that draws people to us. Put another way, it is our living out our faith in Christ that validates the faith of Christ in the midst of a skeptical, skeptical world that has seen little true Christian witness. Let me say that again. It is our living out our faith in Christ that validates the faith of Christ in the midst of a skeptical world that has seen little true Christian witness. See, we make Jesus more or less believable by how we live. See, ultimately, if we're not really revealing to the world that Jesus is overcoming, that, that Jesus changes lives, that Jesus forgives, that Jesus loves, if we're not acting in a way that reflects that to the world, why, why should they believe our message? Why should they be drawn to Jesus if we're not being those kind of people? And so we just have to rec recognize, again, when we talk about sharing our faith, the place we have to start is the nature of our relationship with God. In terms of, again, what are we reflecting about, about us? But also understand that a good, good witness or a poor witness is not a guarantee of anything. You know, in other words, you can... You can effectively get it all right in terms of what you exhibit to, to an unbeliever, what you exhibit to someone that doesn't know Jesus in a personal way. You, you, you can have integrity and you can be kind and you can be loving and you can be forgiving. And you know something? That person just doesn't want to believe. And nothing you do will ever change that. So again, a good witness isn't, isn't a guarantee that someone will be saved. And a bad witness isn't a guarantee that they won't be saved. We have to understand the overpowering nature of the gospel. There is good news here. There is freedom here. There's a relationship with a God that, again, who is sovereign, who is loving, who has a plan, who has a purpose, who has promise in terms of the things that he has said that he will do in terms of showing us the wonder, the beauty, and the enjoyment of following him. You know, so basically the message that we have to the world is, a, is good news. And so therefore, when, when, when we, like that message is true, whether we're aware of witness to it or not, that's the point I'm trying to make. So you can have a bad witness, but you just happen to spot off the gospel to someone, and someone's heart is heavy, someone's heart is needy, someone says, yeah, that's what I want. See, the truth of the gospel is true, whether we witness to it or not. So sometimes we'll be surprised by even our poor witness that someone gets saved because of the power of the gospel. So a good witness isn't a guarantee of someone being saved, and a poor witness isn't. But we have to understand in terms of what Jesus is calling us to, again, what Jesus is asking us to be in terms of being ambassadors of his, that again, us being a witness, us talking about, us sharing our faith, taught, starts with what kind of people we are. So let's talk for a moment about ju just what that process is, just what Jesus is calling us to. And you know, I just don't want to presume that everyone here has, ta has taken even that first step. That ultimately, if, you hear, if you're sitting here and you're hearing what I say, and you say, I have no clue what you're talking about. You know, this is kind of like, the, well, if we go back to the mafia, this is kind of like, we're talking about step 10 in terms of how you're functioning in the family. And you haven't even taken, you haven't gotten the kiss yet. You haven't had the handshake. You're not in the family. And there's a step we have to take in terms of entering God's family that is about faith in Christ. That if, you, if you've never gotten to that place where you have made a, made a covenant with God, effectively is what it comes up. It really is about that test, test that, 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 um, a testament in terms of, again, a covenantal relationship with God. But if you have never believed in Jesus, 
If you've never got, had a place in a time in your life where, again, you've understand, understood who Jesus is, you've understood what the cross is all about, that also when He died on the cross, what the Bible says is He bore in His physical body all the sins of the world. Your sins, my sins, your neighbor's sins, your father's sins, the guy in China, <laughs> all the sin of all the world of all time was placed on Jesus. Because you know why? Because that debt had to be paid. Sin, there had to be an answer to it. See, God in His love could, just not, could not just overlook sin. He could say, ah, no big deal. I know you've done wrong, but I'll just overlook that. Now come into the family. No, what he said is that sin needs to be dealt with. But the good news of the gospel is that God comes to him and says, says, I'm not asking you to deal with it. I'm asking you to believe in the source. I'm asking you to believe in the sacrifice. I'm asking you to believe in the one who has borne that burden for you. He's taking your place. He was your substitute. He died on the cross so that we didn't have to. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And if you have never taken that step in terms of recognizing your need for a Savior, recognizing there's no path that you could ever form to get to God, but the fact that God has come down to you, offered His Son, and now only asks of you that you believe. That you express faith in what I said before. That I believe that it's true amongst all the things that everyone else says. All the other religions of the world. All the other commentators on the internet saying this and that about that and this. And all these things. Amongst all those voices. No, Jesus is true. I believe what he says. I'm with him. I'm trusting that. That's what's real. Not all this other stuff. This is what's real. The gospel, the cross, Jesus, I believe in you. Then I entrust myself. See, that's what that faith in Jesus is. That's what God is calling you to. See, he's done the work of salvation. All he's asking you to do is believe. Connect to that work by will to choose to believe. And again, if you have never, if you have never made that step, everything I've said just about up to this point really had nothing to do with you. Except maybe the mafia point. No. Um, not, in other words, this is the point you have to understand. That's not about making disciples. You, you need to be made a disciple. So if you're here and where you are is you need to be made a disciple. The call in your life is not to make disciples and go to the nations of teaching and back. No, you need to be baptized. You need to be instructed. You need to be believing. And so if, if, if that's where you are, just understand... Um, but for those who have made that step, I, I, I've purposed, I've proposed, rather proposed is a better word there, five points of growth, five, five connecting points in terms of our knowledge of God. And I just want to take a few moments to ask just where we are with these things. The five things that I look at in the scripture in terms of those things that specifically talk about these things that we do to get closer to God and grow in Him. And that is worship. That is being in the Word. That's the Bible. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being in prayer. And being in fellowship, the fellowship of believers. Again, it's worship. Thinking big thoughts about God. Whether that's through reading or singing or speaking. Whatever it is. To be, being in the Word of God on a daily basis. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. And understanding what's all about that. Praying to God. And then the fellowship of believers. You know, there's other things that you could point to in Scripture in terms of what God would make available to us to connect with Him. But if you're not doing those five things, then something's off. So, something's broken. Because I believe in terms of our walk with God, again, growing in Him, growing in character, growing in transformation, getting to know Him, we will not, that will not happen outside of these five things. They're, they're actually pretty specific and critical things the Bible says about each of these things, about how they lead us closer to God. And you know, as I thought about it, in terms of these five things, because I was, I was kind of convicted how there's no response in that. 
Like in other words, we talk about worship, we talk about the Word of God, we talk about the Holy Spirit, we talk about prayer, we talk about the fellowship of believers. But then, where does that go? And what I like about being in Matthew 28 is because I think where those things go are into obedience and evangelism. That ultimately, when we think about when, as we grow closer to God through those five things, and we, as we uh, grow in our Christian walk from those five things, how we can know it's working is we're more obedient. How we can know it's working, or how we can know the direction God is leading us as we grow closer to Him, we evangelize, we represent Him, we make disciples. So again, that's, that's the process. That we engage with these five things, we become inspired and convicted and transformed by them, and then we obey Him, and then we, we, we speak to the world, we reflect Christ to the world in terms of what He desires for us to be. You've heard me say a lot today. I, I, we, we could turn to Colossians 4. I'll, we'll just about turn there and I'll read a couple verses. So what I'll do, even though it's, it, you know, it's not the way I would normally want to end in a, in a kind of an abrupt way like this, but I think this is where we will end. But again, I, I, just, I, would just, I would just ask at this point, again, for those who have never believed in Jesus to think about again, where, where are you in that, in that process? What is it that's brought you here today? Where, where are you in your understanding of who God is and what Jesus is calling you to in terms of faith in Him? And then where are we in terms of our lives before Christ? Like, are we, are we ready to take what Jesus says here and, and live it and follow it? Are we going to take seriously this commissioning? And again, to understand it starts with us. That if we're going to be good witnesses, our lives need to be a certain way. There's a certain protocol that God would have for us. And then we'll look at some other great dynamics in Scripture. And, and just some practical advice in terms of, again, sharing our faith and being the people God would want us to be in terms of evangelism. Let's bow and let's pray. Father, we just do uh, thank you for this time. And when we do thank you for Jesus... That, that ultimately He is the reason for it all. Whether at, we're at a place where we've never believed in Him, and in the thing you're calling us to, or even, even at this moment, is to believe, to accept the death that He died to be the payment for my sin. That is what all of us need to do. There is no human being that you do not call to ultimately Welcome them into the kingdom. Welcome them into relationship. And so, Father, it is on all of us at some point in time in our lives to make that contract with you, to base our relationship with you in Christ and the sacrifice that he made on the cross. And so, Father, I just pray for anyone here that has never believed that, that maybe today is your day of salvation. Maybe today is the day that God is, is ministering truth to you far better than I ever could. And you do sense a drawing, drawing in your heart from God. And the Bible talks about that. In fact, it says that no one can be saved except the true Christ. Then I just encourage you to respond. Respond in faith. Yes, I want that. Yes, I want Him. I want to be saved. I want to believe in Jesus. I want to accept the death that He died on the cross for me. And if you do that, the Bible says that you become a child of God. You become part of the family. Now it's time to learn the protocol. It's time to grow in that faith and grow in that understanding of how God would have you to be. But Father, for the rest of us, I just pray that as we internalize what Jesus is saying, that we would take the time in terms of our lives to think about how we're engaging with you. How, how, how much do we care about and think about being filled with the Spirit? Well, what, what kind of time are we taking in your word? Are, are, are our prayers lackluster prayers? Are we, are we truly engaging in fellowship with you? Are we truly trying to discover a plan, discover a purpose, just, just to connect with the God of the universe in a personal way through, through the relationship that God has for us in prayer? And are we engaging with each other in purposeful ways in terms of not only our edification, 
but encouragement in terms of living the Christian life. And so, Father, I just pray that you would help us to think more intentionally about these things this week. And just, again, to think about just where we are in terms of responding to this commission. Father, we lay all this before you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.